So we finished talking about the Kingdom Protista multicellular primary producers. Now we need to talk about true plants, Kingdom Plantae. Remember, they have true roots. They have uh, vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, so they are different than the seaweeds. Um, two main groups we need to talk about. One are seagrasses and the other the mangroves. We'll cover mangroves a little bit later. So true plants, seagrasses. Um, these are basically plants that live completely beneath the water. Their full life cycle occurs submerged. So we call these submergent uh, plants. We also call them hydrophytes. Uh, around the world, there's roughly 66 known species. And fun fact, they're not really uh, true grasses, but they're closely related to lilies. Now, in the Indian River Lagoon, we have seven species that are, that are found there. Turtle grass, widgeon grass, manatee grass, paddle grass, shoal grass, Johnson seagrass, which is kind of unique because it's never been seen to flower. These are all flowering plants, but Johnson's seagrass has only been known to reproduce asexually through uh, fragmentation and vegetative growth. And the last one is star grass. Now in our area here in Brevard County, we have six seagrasses, not all seven of them. Uh, turtle grass uh, doesn't start growing until you get about maybe an hour south of here, you start finding turtle grass in the Indian River Lagoon. Where we are here in Brevard County, it's just a wee bit too, uh, too cold for them. Uh, here's some examples of what they look like. This is turtle grass. And the big thing about this particular species, it has really wide blades. So that, that's what makes it kind of unique. This is manatee grass. Now, what's interesting about manatee grass is, yes, manatees love to to eat it, but they love to eat all grasses, any kind of grasses they can find. But the blades on manatee grass are round. So this is a really easy species to identify. If you pull up a, a blade, you can actually like roll it, you know, like this between your uh, index finger and your thumb. The other blades, other species are all flat, so you can't do that. Uh, this is a uh, widgeon grass here. This is show of, that was, Actually, go back. That was shoal grass. This is widgeon grass. This is uh, Johnson's seagrass. This is paddle grass. Very similar looking, but there are differences. And this is star grass. So those are the seven species of seagrasses found in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, a few things about them. It says up here that they grow through vegetative growth. What that is is something like this. You see this, this is a piece of St. Augustine, but it grows in clumps and then it sends out these runners like you see here. And then we see blades popping up. Now this uh, structure right here is not a root. This is a rhizome. And I know you can't really see, maybe you can a little bit right here, these little pieces here. These are the true roots where this is the rhizome. These horizontal stems is actually what that is. And from them, branch off these blades. And I'm going to show you in a few seconds an example of uh, shoal grass. That's, that's the same way. Um, they do flower. The flower is typically at the base of the plant, uh, right, around, right along the rhizome for seagrasses, not for true like St. Augustine here. And um, they're not very large flowers. They're very small flowers. They're, very, they're not brightly colored. There's no need because the reason Flowers are so colorful, so large, have smells to them, is to attract pollinators. Well, seagrasses don't need pollinators to help move pollen because the ocean currents, the water movement moves, the, uh, moves it for them. So let's take a look right now at some, uh, some shoal grass and the same structures. I'm going to show you from a specimen that I collected uh, just the other day. All right, if you can see it right here, this is a piece of shoal grass. We see the blades right up here. Let me get something better to point with. Uh, we see the blades. We see this horizontal stem. This is the rhizome. This is not a root. And then sticking down from the rhizome, we see these true roots. Here's one here. There's one there. 
there. These are the true roots. See some right, right there. So this specimen here of shoal grass grows out here in the Indian River Lagoon. And you see how vegetative growth, it started here, adding on more and more and more. And then these shoots will, uh, will pop up. So that is an example. So now back to the presentation. Now we're back, so let's uh, keep talking here. Um, not much information here to really talk about. The big thing is the roots can form a dense matrix that can hold sediments. So, so seagrasses are really important along with mangroves for helping to trap and hold sediment in place. This prevents and slows down uh, erosion. So really important to marine organisms and ecosystems. A um, few facts, less than 1% of the total ocean biomass production is from seagrasses, so they're not a big contributor. Uh, birds and humans can eat the rhizomes and seeds. Uh, the leaves are grazed upon by manatees, dugongs, which are a close relative of, um, of manatees, sea turtles, and, and there's lot, actually lots of fish that also can eat the grass that are herbivores. They help in the deposition and stabilization of sediments, as I just said, and important habitat. If you look at these bottom two pictures, let's get rid of that. Um, let me... Uh, my pointer here. You can actually see this really, really dense uh, turtle grass bed. And at the bottom here, this is the rhizomes, the, the, the matrix of roots and horizontal stems that trap the sediment. Sometimes uh, an area of seagrass will actually die and uh, the sea floor, typically a sandy bottom, will be exposed. And you can kind of tell we call this a blowout. This area right here is actually deeper and it's sandy on the bottom. Uh, I'm kind of inside of one of these right here where I took that picture. You can see where you can see the bottom right there. So um, very important for the stabilization of sediments. Uh, all right, that's it for seagrasses. Now let's talk a little bit about mangroves. We've talked a lot about mangroves uh, in this class already back in ecology. And we had guest speakers come in and talk about mangroves. And of course, we've gone out and we planted the red mangrove propagules. So First thing to say about mangroves, they're not all trees. This is a really diverse group. Uh, mangroves are not all related to each other, like in the same family of plants. They're basically grouped in this group based on their ability to deal with salt water. Uh, some can be trees, shrubs, palms, even ferns can be considered mangroves. Here in the Indian River Lagoon, here in Florida, here on the East Coast of the United States, we have here in the Atlantic Basin, basically we have three species of mangroves, the red, the black and the white, and we've, we've talked about this. They're found in tropical to subtropical areas. We are right at the very edge of where mangroves can be found. If you go a little farther north, say up to Daytona Beach, you don't see any or hardly any mangroves, where here they're, they're pretty much everywhere. And um, they, they like areas with limited, with not a lot of wave action, a low slope, so a gentle, you know, incline or decline of the, uh, of the sea, of the, of the land and there's a high rate of sedimentation around them. They help to trap sediments and allow them to build up. And typically they like to live in soil that is waterlogged. Not many organisms can or plants can handle waterlogged conditions. The mangroves can, which allow them to thrive in these uh, in these ecosystems over other plants. All right, so here's the three species. We see the red mangrove here. Uh, characterized by these prop roots and these aerial roots. We see this actually growing over the water. Again, these are called prop roots because they prop the tree above the water. This is the black mangrove found a little bit further inland. One of the big things that's notable about them are these roots that extend out from the, uh, from the tree and it sends up these pneumatophores, which look just like this. They call these snorkels. We'll talk more about those in a, in a few minutes. And then this is the white mangrove found a little farther in, very oval shaped leaves. All right, so um, they, I mentioned before, they live in a very inhospitable environment. They have to deal with salt water, anoxic sediment. This is sediment that has no oxygen in it, loose sediment, wave action, daily changes in sea level, basically the tides. So they've had to evolve adaptations to be able to handle these, these conditions. And they have done that, therefore they can thrive in these in these areas where most other plants or all their plants cannot. Um, salt water, first thing to say about that, they, they gotta be able to deal with salt water. We all know plants need water 
for photosynthesis, 6 CO2 plus 6 H2O plus sunlight yields C6, H12O6 plus 6O2. So they need that H2O, but they don't want the salt. So they got to figure out ways to get rid of it. We call these organisms halophytes. Halophytes are organisms that can deal with high salinity uh, conditions or environments. Um, so some of the structures that mangroves have that allow them to survive, one is we'll talk about the roots. And first, we'll talk about the red mangrove roots. They have these aerial roots. These are roots that actually branch off of the, the branches, and you see down here, and extend downward. And they can actually extend down into the water, and then they actually, I guess, kind of sort of turn into prop roots to prop it up. So as this tree here gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it sends out more roots like that, and it can actually grow outward in all directions. They also have these stilt roots, which you see right here. This is the trunk of the tree here. Here, we use this example. This is the trunk of the tree, and these stilt roots actually hold the tree above water, so giving it a greater chance to, to survive. Um, here's another example. Uh, Pneumatophores, we'll talk about those for a second again, they extend outward from the anchor roots into the air, and we see these right here. So these are sometimes referred to snorkel roots. What happens is all plants need oxygen for cellular respiration. Yes, they undergo photosynthesis, but they also undergo cellular respiration. And the roots down below the, uh, you know, down underground have to, uh, uh, they get nutrients, they get glucose from the leaves high up in the, in the air, and it travels down the plant through the vascular tissue. It goes to the roots. The roots are alive. The roots are growing. Um, so they got to be breaking down sugar, releasing energy, and they need oxygen. Now, earlier I said they have to deal with anoxic sediments. That's the condition that the, that the black mangrove lives in. So it sends up these, these roots into the air. Okay, we see here and they can take in oxygen, send it down to the root tips, and uh, that's where that oxygen is then used for cellular respiration. No photosynthesis happening in the roots, obviously, because there's no sunlight down there, but cellular respiration is happening. So they do need oxygen, and they get it uh, through these pneumatophores. Uh, and their leaves. Last thing to talk about their leaves. Now, a couple of interesting facts is the red and the black mangrove will actually build up salt in uh, the leaves. And then for the red mangrove, what will happen is the uh, salt will get so concentrated in the leaves that the plant will sacrifice the leaves, sacrificial leaves are called, and they have a high concentration of salt and the leaves turn, turn yellow and fall off. This is a natural process. This is how the plant gets rid of that excess salt. Now the black mangrove uh, will also do this, but what's also neat is on the back of the leaf, quite often the salt is excreted and you can actually find salt crystals forming on the backside of the leaves. You can take those leaves, you can see the salt crystals, you can lick them and they taste very, very salty. Not that I'm recommending you going out and licking black mangrove leaves. Um, these leaves are, are never really submerged. So there's no way of washing it off. Uh, now, the white mangrove, the one that's furthest away from the salt water, doesn't have to deal with salt as much because the, the water table, the groundwater is fresher, has less salt. So it, it can excrete it just um, in other ways. But there is something unique about the, uh, the white mangrove. It has these two little pores at the base of each leaf called nectaries. And right there, nectaries. And what happens is uh, it excretes a, a sugar solution. Now, you might be asking, why does a mangrove excrete sugar rather than storing it and using it? Well, what happens is it attracts ants. And these ants are thought are, are basically in a symbiotic relationship with the tree. They feed on the sugar that this plant uh, uh, releases for them. And then the ants will help protect the mangrove from herbivores. So if a deer or some other herbivore was browsing on these, these white mangrove leaves, it would... Uh, it would shake the tree, agitate the ants. They would start moving around, finding that herbivore and biting, stinging, you know, whatever. Uh, so mutualistic symbiosis. Um, here are examples of the three leaves. You can actually see the salt crystals on this uh, black mangrove, kind of over here too. 
Right here, we're looking in this picture here, we're looking at white mangroves. So I have a uh, white mangrove leaf over here. I'm going to show you these nectaries, but you can see them right there and right there. These little bumps right there. So let's pause here for a second and uh, go to my digital microscope. All right, we're back now. So you saw the nectaries, and uh, we got a few more things to uh, talk about here. So let's move on. Uh, the propagules, we know what those are. We planted those uh, earlier in the year. They look something like this right here. This is not a red mangrove seed. This is actually the seedling of a red mangrove. So what happens is because these drop into salt water, which is a very inhospitable environment, the seed actually germinates while it's still attached to the tree, producing the next generation, and it starts growing. So it's, it's kind of getting more developed before it's released from the parent. Eventually these drop, they drift around in the ocean currents. When they encounter shallow water, the dark end will get, will get lodged in the bottom, the roots come out, stem and leaves start growing and we and a new plant starts growing in that spot so really important this is these can drift for over a year in the ocean currents um the zonation this is really key here this is a great picture here we see the uh the the black man the red mangrove growing out over the water we have these prop roots a little bit further inland we have the black mangrove with the pneumatophores further inland we have above the high tide mark, we have the white mangrove. Now what happens is uh, when water is moving between all these roots, it slows down the ocean, the current, the speed of the water, and it can no longer hold sedimentation. So what happens is this area gets shallower and shallower and shallower as sediment gets deposited. At first over here, it's too deep for a new pneumatophore to get deposited. Uh, but, or a new propagule, excuse me, get deposited. But as this area fills in, this area here becomes shallower and eventually pneumatophores can drop, propagules can drop here and start growing. So these trees, the red mangroves, start growing out in that direction as they make the, the area shallower and shallower and shallower. So eventually this area here looks like this area here. And now the black mangrove outcompetes the red mangroves that were here, and this starts growing here. Eventually, this area, because of because this area also these roots also trap sediment, but comes above the high tide line, and now the the white mangrove can outcompete the black mangrove, and you start seeing white mangroves grow here. So what happens over time is these plants start growing and moving in that direction. Uh, when I lived in Jamaica, there was an area called the town of New Seville. It was ruins. It was basically the first uh, town on the island, about 500 years old. And you can walk through this mangrove swamp, and there's an old stone pier that sticks out about 100 feet or so. And you can walk all the way to the end of it. When you get to the end of it, you're still about, I don't know, half a mile until you get to the ocean, showing you how those mangroves over 500 years have traveled, you know, outward, uh, Creating, creating more and more and more uh, land. So if you're looking for a good investment, you buy land that has mangroves. In a couple hundred years, you'll probably double your acreage of your property. So, so keep that in mind. Um, so again, these are halophytes. We've talked about that. They can, they can deal with high salt. And of course, examples are both the seagrasses and the mangroves. And with that, we are done. So that's the end of the notes for this chapter. Remember, our test is on Friday.